Um, so hello everybody, um, welcome to today's discussion on climate change and what can be done about it, conversation between a politician and a scholar. My name is Jade McGlynn, I'm a former MSSR fellow, you all already know me from Monday, but um, but yes, a former MSSR fellow and now I'm a tutor um, at Oxford and director of research at um, Henry Jack Society, a London think tank. Today, I'm going to be moderating a discussion uh, inspired um, by Professor Levin's book, State, um, a truly um, excellent read that applies a refreshing dose of realism to the climate crisis. Um, and in today's discussion, following on in part from yesterday's discussion that you had, uh, we're going to delve deeper into, into some of the, the topics and issues that, that arise in the book. And to do so, we are very spoke to be joined, of course, by the author um, of the book uh, himself, Professor Stephen, who is a professor at, at Georgetown University School of Foreign Studies in Qatar and um, a senior fellow of the New America Foundation in Washington. Previously, Professor Levin was Chair of International Relations and Terrorism Studies in the War Studies Department at King's College here in London. He frequently writes for the international media and has testified before committees and subcommittees of the US Congress and the British Parliament, speaking on numerous occasions at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Department of State and the French Foreign Ministry, as well as a huge range of US, European, Russian and Chinese universities and institutes. We also have the incredible honor of being joined by Governor Jerry Brown, whose own efforts to tackle the climate crisis have been tireless. Governor Brown completed his fourth term governor of the state of California in 2019. He first became governor of California in 1974 and was re-elected in 1978. After his first two terms, Governor Brown lectured and traveled widely. He practiced law. He served as chairman of the Democratic Party and he ran for president. He was elected mayor of Oakland in 1998 and California attorney general in 2006. He was elected to a third gubernatorial term in 2010 and a fourth term in 2014. During this time, Governor Brown helped eliminate the state's multi-million budget deficit, spearheaded successful campaigns to provide new funding for California's schools and established a robust rainy day fund to prepare for the next economic downturn. And especially relevant to today's discussion, his administration established nation leading targets to protect the environment and fight climate change. Governor Brown, Professor Levin, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Look forward to it. Could I start with a question addressed to, to both speakers? And that is, what has gone wrong so far in terms of how different political groups and actors have addressed the climate crisis? Perhaps I could start with you, Governor Brown. What's going wrong? I, I didn't hear your full question. Say it again. What's gone wrong? Um, so what are, what are politicians, political groups, nations, what are we doing wrong? Well, what what, we're, what's being done wrong is uh, the failure to uh, grasp and take fully the consequence of what the world's facing with the climate threat. Global warming is real. It's been denied uh, by many in powerful circles, particularly Republicans in America, uh, particularly by oil companies, uh, other, national, other national leaders. So we have a, a global threat that is the result of our entire modern culture based as it, as it is on fossil fuel. So uh, the nature of this threat, well, it, the, the immediate causation is the uh, emission of somewhat somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 billion tons of CO2 or CO2 equivalents every year. And that is piling up a, a blanket of sorts, uh, encompassing the earth, making everything warmer. And uh, the, the trajectory we're on, uh, it's obviously gonna get warmer because the uh, CO2 uh, piles up and stays for hundreds of years. Now, recognizing that uh, demands an immediate action, an action to curb as rapidly as possible, uh, the CO2 emissions and the emissions of other greenhouse gases uh, like soot and methane and fluorocarbon. So there, it, it's clear what's causing it, what we have to do. Now, the problem is because we are a fossil fuel culture, it's not so easy uh, to change, or it's a word that 
that many politicians are using right now, transform. Now, transformation is a big word. It means changing the very form of what we are. So that's not going to happen overnight. Uh, it may never happen completely. Uh, so we, we need to get the recognition that we can take action because we have the technical means, uh, certainly to curb the, uh, the greenhouse gases much more than we're doing today, dramatically. And we have to keep inventing technologies so that we can extract carbon from the atmosphere and continue building a society, a shelter, technology, a food production, a manufacturing, all on a zero or near zero carbon basis. So that's a big tall order, but uh, the biosphere uh, is not giving us any, it's not giving us a pass, uh, no leeway here. Uh, the the uh, uh, science, biology, atmospheric, uh, chemical science, it's all, it, it, it's basic. It doesn't listen to political compromise. So the big people have to understand what's going on and lead this change, which, I mean, just to show America, uh, we have 50 votes, and uh, one of the votes uh, among the Democrat studies, 50 versus 50, um, uh, one of the votes needed is from a coal country, West Virginia. So how we do all that, uh, curbing jobs, eliminating jobs, and yet getting people to embrace it by having a, a, a society that supports people during this very uh, difficult transition, that's where we are. So uh, things are bad because the nature of the task is so is so huge and politicians uh, like to talk big in the rhetoric but like to act uh, small in, in little steps because given the conflict and the divisions in governments uh, that's about the most you can get so until we get a, a bigger uh, hit a, a bigger experience of what global warming is doing we're going to move at this glacial pace Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Governor Brown. Professor Levin, do you, do you agree with what Governor Brown said, and in particular with the reasons why we haven't seen an adequate response or immediate action um, to, to the scale of the problem? Yes, I, I think the Governor has summed it up very well um, in saying, you know, that we are a fossil fuel economy society, and we have been, uh, of course, not just since the Industrial Revolution, but um, since the first pre-human lit of cut down a tree and lit a fire. Um, and it is very difficult to get away from that. Uh, and then, you know, all kinds of very familiar human features kick in. Um, there is self-interest, um, obviously the self-interest of the corporations concerned, but also the self-interest of people who do not want to pay higher fuel prices, pay higher taxes. Uh, especially not as, you know, I was saying yesterday, for the sake of future generations who they, they won't see. So there is, a, there is a lack of altruism, there is a lack of willingness to sacrifice, there is a lack of moral courage on the part of politicians to ask people for sacrifices, although perhaps it's unfair to blame the politicians too much because all too often, I'm afraid, when they have gone to people and asked them for sacrifices, the people with by thumping majorities have said no. So, you know, one, should, one can't simply blame the, the, the politicians for what has gone wrong. And I think that also um, there is something like a lack of imagination. Uh, this is uh, certainly for us in the West, not necessarily for people in other places, a, a, a very, a, a, in historical terms, a very new kind of threat. And our institutions, our leaders, our political traditions are just not configured to think about this threat. I mean, they, they have begun to, but very, very slowly. I was talking yesterday about how our security institutions you know, continue to be obsessed with threats which are minor compared to climate change when it comes to the real interests of the United States or of Russia or of China. Um, and I think one, so it's a very, it's a, it's a new threat which people find it hard to get their minds around. And of course, as has so often been pointed out, um, every system in the world, not just 
not just in the West, in China, in Russia, in India, has become obsessed with growth, you know, simply with GDP growth. This, you know, has been the, you know, the standard for the success of a government. And unfortunately, I mean, especially over the past 30 years, 30, 40 years or so, you know, not even growth that benefits the population as a whole, just growth for the sake of growth. It's very difficult to get away from that. Uh, but I'm sorry to keep brushing my hair. One of the things I've not had due to COVID is a haircut for a very long time. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think I, I, I may be reduced to my wife cutting it for me. Um, so yes, this lack of, you know, this lack of imagination and the, the built-in problems of our institutions. And I think perhaps also, I mean, one reason why relative to the West, of course, the Chinese continue to pump out more and more carbon gases, but actually in, in terms of their relative living standards, the Chinese have done a good deal more than us so far. And I think that one reason for that is that, um, of course, America suffers from natural disasters more than Europe, but even America so far, and even with, given Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, there have been, I think, in this the past um, 150 years of American history, only four floods which have claimed more than a thousand victims at one go, possibly more. I think that's it. Uh, in China, uh, over the past 150 years, there have been six floods which have claimed more than 100,000 victims, and four of them have claimed more than a million victims. The biggest of them, directly and indirectly, uh, took between three and six million dead when the, the rivers burst their banks, the Yellow River changed course. I, I think that there is, in, in some other places, an awareness of the potential for natural disaster that we lack. I mean, we will acquire it. I mean, they're acquiring it in Canada and the Northwestern United States as we speak. Um, and of course, COVID has been a great lesson. But I, my fear is we're not, we're not acquiring that, that sense of what an affrontive nature can do to us nearly quickly enough. We just don't have the, the background. Thank you very much. Um, your point in particular around economics, it reminded me of in the early pages of your book, you wrote about a statistic, I think it was younger Americans were unwilling to pay $10 more in taxes um, to deal with the, price, uh, the climate crisis or in, for the future, but they were, there was $200 that was, uh, in taxes that were spent on, on, on defence. Um, I thought it, was, it summed up the problem quite neatly. I don't know why it particularly stayed in my mind. Um, We've anticipated actually quite a few of the questions that we're going to discuss, but first of all, I'd like to just stay a bit more focused in my next question, um, which is directed to Governor Brown on, on the political question um, and I suppose um, some of his personal experience. So Governor Brown, in your time as Governor of California, as I said in my introduction, you passed um, some very ambitious climate change policies, um, increasing renewable energy, reducing carbon emissions, what did it take to do this? What did it require to push through the changes? Census building or force of personality and imagination? It took a different kind of Republican to be in power. At the time George Bush took over in uh, 2001, I believe, uh, he had said before he was going to do something about climate change. And then he reversed course uh, under the pressure of the Republican oil companies, the business, the market ideology, all that pushed him in utter denial about climate change. So he did nothing. Uh, okay, so what happened in California? We had a different situation. We had Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, who came in a few years after that, 2004. Uh, he did something about uh, global warming. He signed a very uh, important law. Now, he didn't operate in a vacuum. Uh, California at the time of the Nixon presidency, uh, Ronald Reagan was governor. And together, uh, they were supportive in one passage of the, the Clean Air Act that gave California a specific prerogative to set uh, more ambitious standards than the national government. 
which is what they did. Uh, so we had Ronald Reagan, and then I became governor for eight years and, and pushed the ball further. And then we had a series of, of two more Republicans, a Democrat, and then Schwarzenegger, and then myself. Now, none of these people were climate deniers. None of these people were environmental deniers. Plus, beginning back under Reagan, uh, a mechanism was created called the California Air Resources Board that had the legal, the coercive power of government to order things, to require the electric companies, the gas companies, to produce uh, uh, pollutants. And eventually, under the law that Schwarzenegger signed, reduce uh, carbon emissions, CO2 emissions. So we had the institutional capacity, we had the political uh, acceptability on uh, both the Republican side and the Democratic side of dealing with pollution, the first pollution. Now, why did that happen? Well, it happened because the smog in Los Angeles was terrible in the 50s and the 60s. And so even Republicans, in fact, I don't say even, uh, there was no distinction really in the distaste for the yellow haze that engulfed Los Angeles, where uh, in that area, 50% of the people uh, who watch California television are watching it uh, on Los Angeles stations. So that uh, gave the impetus to establishing a powerful uh, environmental government mechanism. Ronald Reagan signed another bill, which was uh, modified by the Democratic legislature of his time that created the California Energy Commission. And this also had the power to cite uh, power plants and to adopt uh, building regulation standards and uh, appliance energy efficient standards. Very bold moves at the time. This was, these were all passed in 1974, uh, the very year I was elected as governor. So we had a supportive environment uh, to begin with, we had the institutional power to actually do something more than mere rhetoric. And then uh, as the issue heated up and I became governor, it was something that I wanted. And the Democrats run everything and they're very liberal. And this sounds liberal until it steps on one interest or another. So I think uh, we had favorable conditions. But if you ask me, will this be enough going forward? And I say, absolutely not. Uh, the next round of reductions and legal uh, impositions will be much more stringent and will step on more powerful people and to sustain it will take quite a bit uh, of effort. In fact, right now there's a fight with the, uh, the uh, oil refineries wherein the labor union, the business trades, the plumbers, the carpenters, the electricians, they're joining with the oil industry fighting uh, the environmentalists and what are called the environmental justice advocates. And so already we're getting a collision of interests. So I would say to continue on the, on the uh, trajectory that we're on, we'll take uh, deeper, uh, much more resolute commitment than has been generated to date. So we're gonna be ahead of America in many parts of the world, but like the rest of the world, we are laggards uh, relative to the threat and what we're bringing to curb and eliminate the threat. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Brown, for your insights. Um, first, Levin, I have a separate question to you, but first of all, is there any points that you'd like to pick up on there in, in Governor Brown's answer? Um, a couple of things, I suppose. Uh, the first, the importance of leadership, both by Schwarzenegger, the governator, uh, and by Governor Brown himself. You know, strong leadership can make a difference. The tremendous importance, as I stressed in my book, of, of trying, I, I wouldn't say exactly for a bipartisan approach, that was possible in California, thank God, but alas, at the national level in America, it looks terribly difficult, but the, the critical importance of trying to appeal at least to enough voters from the other side of the political aisle. Uh, because, you know, I was just reading again today uh, about how, you know, the lack of a solid majority, well, the lack of any majority in the Senate, if you count, um, uh, make that, what's his name, Matchin of West Virginia as, you know, in effect on the other side of this issue, 
makes it so difficult you know, to get serious climate change action through. Um, so yes, I mean the need to appeal to um, uh, to Republican voters yeah. is terribly important. I would just interject. You know, there's a great deal of of um, eloquence coming out of American leaders about the, the power of democracy and our rules-based order. But if you go to Washington, you look at the functioning of this democracy, uh, deeply polarized, uh, unimaginative, and uh, facing uh, incredible barriers uh, to adapting important policies and then carrying them through. So Biden's made some important steps, but he's up against an institutional breakdown, any kind of governing consensus that in former times was shaped by elites that uh, no longer enjoy the prerogatives, maybe rightfully so, but there's no new uh, governing, uh, I'll say elite, or a group that feels enough connectivity and solidarity that over time they can push and sustain policies. So this is, is quite a uh, marketplace of confusion uh, where, uh, you know, the invisible hand is wrecking havoc uh, in, in America. And certainly when we juxtapose this system as it really works today with the other systems of which we find so much wrong, it is no, by no means clear to me which system is going to get us through and get us to a more sustainable future. Thank you. And there is, of course, a particular problem in America, which is the US Constitution. Uh, which, you know, worked so magnificently for so long, um, but which it seems, you know, many of the provisions of the Constitution, you know, to take this ridiculous filibuster, it's only one example, um, you know, some super majorities, the, the very composition of the Senate, the Supreme Court, uh, these are becoming obstacles to effective government and, you know, contributors uh, to the effects of polarization and um, and paralysis, and from time to time, you know, my, my gloomier moments, you know, I, I wonder, and not just about America, um, more generally, you know, whether we are like previous systems which worked magnificently to meet, you know, in their eras, to meet a particular set of challenges, and then just were not configured. They just were not capable of meeting the new challenges. One thinks of the Chinese Confucian system of government, you know, which, which worked fantastically, uh, you know, came back and back and back every time a dynasty fell or an empire fell, they would rebuild it on the same basis for almost 2,500 years, but proved completely incapable of meeting the challenge of Western capitalism you know, in the, and technological development in the 19th century. I hope that's not the case, but that's that's the sort of thing I, I deeply worry about. Um, just one one more thing, which is which would be optimistic, I think, if only we had the time. And that's what the governor said about the, the importance of uh, air quality in California, the smogs in Los Angeles, in in driving um, environmental reform, because people saw it, they suffered from it. Same thing in, in much of Europe. And uh, of course it took even longer, but if you, if you look at attitudes to cigarettes, to tobacco, and progressive you know, moves to limit tobacco, because people gradually just came to see the effects. Uh, or on a smaller scale, the eventual acceptance of things like seatbelts in cars, tremendous opposition when it was first introduced, but you know, Eventually, people do see the results, you know, the bad results, the good results. Now, I think that um, with time, you will see the same effect, you know, from the heat waves that we are seeing and the deaths that result, um, the tremendous economic damage and just the, the physical, you know, the physical pressure uh, on, on people and, of course, the, um, <laughs> the tremendous extra costs of having to install air conditioning. If only we had the time, I would actually be quite confident that people will, will come around 
to, you know, to, to much stronger action on climate change because they will begin to feel it on their own skins, as they say in Russia. But, of course, the question is, do we have the time, do we have enough time uh, to, um, to wait you know, for these effects to kick in? Uh, the general kind of scientific consensus seem, uh, is that we don't, that we have to take action much more quickly. And that, you know, that means also really, really, really trying to stir people into action on this. Um, thank you. Um, since we don't have the time, or since the consensus is that we don't have time to wait for the realities of climate change to force people to not see it as an abstract threat and not take it adequately seriously, I'd like to just go back to um, perhaps the issue more of political systems and how to engender that that mobilizing force and professor Levin, i have a question um for you and it comes from your book where you wrote that if action against climate change depends on the abolition of nation states then there will be no action um you wrote this before the pandemic but with particular reference to that statement in what ways um has the pandemic reinforced you anyways well i mean obviously the covid pandemic uh, has emphasize the need for international cooperation. And failures of international cooperation, you know, have been tragic and shameful, frankly, and have had very bad effects. But I think that what COVID has also really emphasized uh, is the, the absolute centrality and inevitability of state action, you know, when, when you need to get things done. Because only states actually have the authority and the executive power to get a lot of things done um, or not done. Uh, you know, they, only they can close borders, only they can impose, in the, in the case of the pandemic, only they can impose lockdowns, only they can you know, shut businesses and enforce um, mask wearing, only they can, you know, the international community, of course, the wealthy nations can and should do much more to distribute vaccines. But of course, the vaccination programs themselves will have to be implemented once again by state medical um, authorities. Uh, and uh, of course, also um, when it comes to public resistance to, to taking the, the, the vaccine, uh, you need, if not state compulsion, well, actually, you do need state compulsion in, in many areas. You know, the state has to say, you know, in this, this, and this, and this category of employment you will be vaccinated or you will be fired or suspended from your job. Um, only, once again, only states, state laws can do that. Um, and states, not only states, I mean, obviously civil society plays a tremendous role as well, but undoubtedly state propaganda, if you like to give it that name, state information campaigns, you know, are also critical just to telling people, for God's sake, get yourself vaccinated. You know, if you don't, you are, you know, you're betraying your neighbors, you're betraying your, your relatives and friends, you're betraying your society. You know, once again, governments have to, have to say that. So once again, I'm in no way, not at all, opposing international cooperation and mm -hmm. you know, the role of international institutions. But I think COVID has really emphasized um, yeah, the, the, in the end, it is states that, that have to act. The other thing that, that I think COVID really has emphasized, but uh, here, once, not just once talking about also state policy, but also more widely in thinking, uh, is that it has accustomed people, you know, even conservatives, perhaps not quite so much in the US, but even in the US, to a level of state intervention in the economy and a level of state spending which would have been inconceivable only two years ago you know i mean that has been quite a revolutionary change now of course there's resistance to biden's infrastructure plan but once again i mean two years ago the republicans wouldn't have considered it at all they would have simply barred it absolutely uh, and i think of course what the pandemic has also showed uh, is that we have uh, as but we should have learned that by the way from the 2008 financial crisis is that we've been told for so long by so many people, oh, this is impossible, it's too expensive, we could never raise the kind of sums needed, you know, to move away from fossil fuels. Well, 
What we have seen is, and that's also why in my book, I, you know, I talk about the, the ex experience of war and preparation for war, and if you like, I mean, military budgets today. In a real crisis, you know, or if something is seen as a real threat, you know, in countries as rich as ours, the money can be found. The money is there, you know, if really necessary and if the need for it is, is recognized. So I think that has also been a, a very positive effect of, of COVID from the climate change point of view. I mean, a third effect, which I had hoped to see, talked about this a bit yesterday, was you know that um, I thought it would really sensitize people to, to the fact that, that, you know, that there, are, there are threats out there which are quite outside, or outside what used to be, the frame of our usual thinking, and that it would sort of really explode people's imaginations a bit when it comes to the, the dangers. But that, it appears, has not really happened. But then sometimes these things take take a while, you know, to, to kick in. So I'm, I'm still fairly hopeful on that score. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a, I think that's a nice way, that's a really evocative way of putting it, that it, the, the hope that it will explode political imaginations at some point. Um, Governor Brown, what lessons do you think that, that world um, leaders or, or multilateral bodies or, or any leaders um, can learn from to the, to the climate crisis? Uh, uh, first lesson is science. That there's something called science and that it tells us facts or important uh, theories or ideas uh, about what's going on in our world. So uh, the fact that you can't see the virus doesn't mean you can't get sick and die. So people put on their masks, they stay in their house, uh, they, they kind of get it. Now, uh, so I think uh, this is a renewed, uh, a renewed uh, confidence in, in scientific reporting scientific uh, evidence uh, statements. Uh, okay, you can't see it, you haven't thought about it before, it's not uh, in your local politics or amusement, uh, education, whatever, but here it is, so wake up. So it's something, it, we had to learn something new, COVID, that's brand new. Okay, so that's important. That, that, that tells us that what appears to be in the ritual confirmation of our everyday uh, imagination or reality isn't necessarily true. Uh, you look at somebody, they look okay. Oh no, they're carrying the virus and pretty soon you got it. So you learn, you learn that story and you got to react. Okay, what's the reaction? Government puts a lot of rules in, number one. And number two, we get scientists that do great work in coming up with a vaccine. And by the way, uh, the vaccine is not Republican or Democrat. Uh, not repressive or libertarian or human rights. It is uh, a set of investigations and observations and conclusions. So I think this is good learning for the uh, the politicians, uh, which I am I'm one. And certainly science is not our main game. The main game, well, there's only one game uh, to any successful politician, and that is continuously thinking about how at the next election he will get more votes than his opponent. I mean, that's the essence of what it is. You can dress it up with Communist Party in China or human rights or whatever in America or Britain or whatever, but bottom line, they're looking for that. So when you get to science, that's a different domain. So I think this is a very helpful, salutary experience that we're learning from the virus. All right, so and I think we can learn about climate, we can learn about uh, cyber, all these other existential threats. I think the, the virus is a very good, uh, it's a very good uh, example as, a, as, our, as our teacher. This is the way the world works, folks. It may not be what you thought yesterday, but you can increasingly uh, learn and, and adapt. And we're doing that to, to, uh, to, to a certain degree. Um, now, what, is the, what have we not yet got? And that is a notion, and, and I, I, I agree that nation state is the power force. Nevertheless, there are things that aren't limited to the nation state, one of which is the virus. 
The other is atmospheric chemistry. Uh, these are all uh, connected. We are connected. So the next step is now the virus we saw, okay, it's the Chinese virus. Yeah, better not use that. I think America didn't want some South American countries to use the Chinese virus. Uh oh, China is engaging in virus diplomacy in Africa. You better watch that. And then the Russian uh, vaccine, rather, uh, vaccine can be used in Europe. Is that right? Does NATO approve of that? So we're very much into our nationalistic uh, uh, blinders that uh, limit our understanding that this reality, the virus, like climate, is global or what I would uh, call planetary. And by my notion of planetary realism, you have to look and exercise your national interest, but realize we're all nationally interested in planetary uh, threats. And we are vulnerable in ways that are similar to other people in other nations being vulnerable. And based on that, there can be, uh, and there must be, uh, some common understanding. That's what the Paris Agreement was. That's a major, major step forward. I can tell you that as governor, I had, well, I had the most vivid was a press conference at the NASA facility uh, near Stanford University. Uh, and at, at this NASA Ames, it's called. And we had uh, several leading scientists, climate scientists, put out a report, a consensus statement, and we released it. And then we took some questions. Not a word of that press conference was reported because that uh, information was not uh, fitting within the rubric of news of the day. And news of the day is an iron imperative. It has the force of any doctrine that might have emanated from the Vatican in the Middle Ages. This is fundamental to modern media. And that is, you shall talk only about news of the day. And longer term things are not news, put it in a book, maybe a magazine, but not the daily news, even the New York Times and the Washington Post. Now, what's happened is climate change has entered news of the day. A lot of things have happened. Uh, you know, votes at the oil company boards of directors, um, yeah, or rather the uh, shareholder meetings, uh, banks, insurance companies, uh, politicians, and now we're getting ready for Glasgow and the uh, COP, uh, Conference of the Party. So uh, we've come up, what I wanted, the point I want to make is not very many years ago, climate was not utterable because it wasn't relevant, it wasn't news of the day. Today, it is actually something that more and more people are thinking about. It's entering into government. Biden is talking about it in ways that Obama, his first four years, never, uh, never uh, thought was that important. So we are making progress. And the question is, uh, what's moving faster? The accumulation of greenhouse gases uh, enveloping our earth uh, or the action of leaders of business, cultural, religious, governmental uh, on planet earth. Thank you very much, Governor Brown. Um, Professor Levin, to pick up on a few of the points that Governor Brown made there, particularly to do with um, nationalism and to link them into one of the core, well, essentially the core, the core argument um, of your book about the power of nationalism as a, as a mobilizational force to, um, to, um, to tackle climate change. What are the ways in which um, nationalism can be channeled? Can we channel that same nationalism that's used to whip up support for defense budgets? And can we put it towards um, targeting it against climate change? And how do we keep it focused in that more positive way without it giving way to the sort of vaccine, um, the accusations of vaccine diplomacy and the sort of less positive forms of nationalism Governor Brown referenced? Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute, Professor Lee. It has to happen once. They asked me to, 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 to mute it so it, it didn't, so it wouldn't interfere. Um, I think the first thing we, we, we have to recognize is that, you know, nationalism is there. It's obviously there in America, it's there in Europe in a more muted way, but of course very strongly present in parts of Europe, 
growing again in other parts. Uh, and of course, it's a tremendously powerful force in other countries of the world. Um, uh, and not just autocracies, but also in many democracies as well, if you look at well, India, to take one example. Uh, so it, it's, you know, nation states are not going away, and nationalism is not going away. So the first thing is, you know, you, you have, if you like, a, a given, and you need to try to shape it in, in positive ways. Whether it will be possible to do so, frankly, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I hope so. That's why I wrote the book, but I'm, you know, I'm vividly aware of the, of the challenges you know, and the difficulties. And of course, naturally, speaking as a historian, I mean, the ambiguity of nationalism, absolutely. And of course, in the, in the book, I make clear again, again, I'm talking about what I call civic nationalism, or what I call patriotism, and clearly a return to ethnic chauvinist nationalism would be a catastrophe, um, given that all our societies are, for a greater or lesser extent now, uh, multi-ethnic. Um, although, of course, on that score, um, nationalism is a threat, but as so many people have pointed out, um, the piece I can't remember, his name in the New York Review of Books uh, a few months ago by somebody from Northern Ireland on the subject of identity politics. He said he'd seen it in Northern Ireland and he'd seen its results and he warned people rather strongly against you know, going down that route. Um, but uh, of course what I argue in the book is, uh, when it comes to the importance of nationalism is twofold. Uh, the first is this point about sacrifice. I, I, you know, I, I, do think, looking at economic realities, um, that people are going to have to make sacrifices uh, if um, if we are going to act quickly enough. Uh, it, it's not that I dismiss the possibility of technological breakthroughs in future, uh, but you know we cannot rely on that. We cannot wait for that. And also, um, you know, if you look at so many of the technological breakthroughs uh, of the past, or, or rather not the breakthroughs, the breakthroughs themselves, but their implementation, states were often or even usually critical to actually you know, bringing in these extremely expensive programs. Not always, but quite often. And you know, on the basis of taxes, that that has been. I mean, if you take um, the, the expansion of the railways in much of the world, you know, that required enormous investment by states, raised in taxes from the population. That has been obscured in the United States, quite frankly, because the, it was possible to fund the expansion of the railways uh, on the basis of enormous amounts of land. Uh, which of course um, had been taken from other people, well, inevitably, but I mean obviously that is not something which was available to China or Japan or Iran or you know, all, all most of Europe or Russia. Um, so the need for sacrifice and if you look at modern history, uh, at least with the decline of religion and with socialism now in abeyance, you know, it, it has been above all nationalism, which has motivated, which has been able to motivate masses of people to make sacrifices. It's the first thing. The second thing is sacrifices for future generations. I talked about this yesterday in this terrible problem which has been raised again and again. How do you get people today to make sacrifices for generations you know, in future? And of course there, the continuity, the future existence of the nation is, is critical. Know, to making this appeal. Um, you know, you want America to be around 200 years from now. If you don't do something about climate change, it's not going to be, you know, or England or Russia or China or whatever. And, you know, as I say about the Chinese as well, the Chinese, you know, when the Chinese leadership say that they are you know, determined to pass a wealthy and successful China onto their grandchildren, they mean their grandchildren, right, <laughs> in the Chinese elites. But in any case, they do have this sense, it seems, which I fear too many people in the West have lost, you know, the, the, of the continuity of Chinese history and the need, you know, to actually work for the future of the country. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is some um, messengers, you know, try to, try to mobilize messengers 
uh, including from the national security elites, which is, of course, very, very difficult, terribly difficult, um, because it may be, you know, only such messengers and only messages couched in these terms, you know, will appeal to all these um, voters who are present, um, you know, will, will not accept uh, the need for action on climate change, or at least certainly not the need for, for radical action. And uh, in California, of course, um, that was one of the great successes also of Schwarzenegger. Um, you know, Sch Schwarzenegger, because of his whole persona, and because of films he'd acted in, and the parts he'd played, you know, could, could really make that climate change argument uh, without being cast by Republican voters, you know, in the kind of mold, alas, of the people who they have learned or been taught to, you know, to hate and, and you know, dismiss and simply not listen to. So those are my, my three arguments for the, um, the importance of nationalism, you know, as uh, when, it, when it comes to trying to find the motivation. And also, you know, once again, as I said yesterday, um, the need, particularly in America, but you know, in, in Europe as well, to a lesser extent, to create a new national dispensation, a new national consensus, like the New Deal, or well, like politically, not like in content, the Reagan Thatcher consensus that was created in the you know in, in the 1980s. And certainly, if you look at American history, I think it's fair to say that it has never been possible to do that without an appeal to American patriotism, or nationalism, if you will, and you know, an appeal in terms of the country as a whole. Um, of course, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was accused by the crazier elements of the Republican Party of lacking patriotism. Uh, but particularly, you know, after the Second World War, that was not a, you know, absolutely not a credible argument for the overwhelming majority of Americans. And, you know, this need to cast, you know, to, 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 to appeal for this new dispensation in national terms is, I think, something that you know, has some um, deep roots and there is a, a great deal of evidence from the history of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, sort of a very coherent overview, actually, um, of, of incredibly complex, um, incredibly complex arguments. Um, now, we're going to very shortly go to questions from the audience. So if the fellows could prepare their questions, but I'm very cheaply going to just ask one final question um, and completely abuse uh, my power as chair, which is on a slightly on a related but a slightly different topic, which is um, I would be interested in hearing um, both speakers thoughts on nuclear energy its role as we try to move towards cleaner forms of energy. Um, Governor Brown, would you like to start? And then I'll come to you, Professor Levin. Yeah, I wish I could give you a, a definitive uh, thought on this, but I don't have one. Uh, people whom I respect, uh, certainly James Hansen, uh, the, uh, the uh, there's people in, well, I won't try to enumerate all the different people who think, Absolutely, we must have nuclear reactors. Uh, some people take a, a more middle path that over the next five to 10 years, nuclear reactors can be made will be far safer in terms of curbing waste and uh, uh, radiological material that could lead to a proliferation of bomb making capacity. So the big risk here is that uh, as you spread nuclear reactors, you spread the science and technique of building nuclear bombs. Uh, these are inextricably linked. Okay, uh, the waste may not be that big a problem. It can cause a lot of financial cost. Uh, that's a problem. Accident can be a problem. Terrorist attack on a nuclear power plant with accumulating um, spent fuel uh, can be a, a disaster for that area. Uh, and of course, the, the proliferation problem. Now, having said the problems, the, the uh, problem of the solar and wind and uh, conservation, it may not, be, it may not be enough to uh, do the job. With a couple of billion more people being born, adding to our planetary population with the uh, growth imperative, uh, you know, we only had 
When I was governor the first time, there were about 300 million cars in the world. Now there's over a billion. And it's very easy to imagine 2 million. Now they're not only going to be electric, and even to make an electric car, it costs a lot of CO2. So given all that, uh, the nuclear option uh, has to be uh, very carefully thought out. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, some of my uh, very thoughtful environmental friends uh, think that's the absolute wrong path. I didn't do very well in physics, and I'm not uh, prepared uh, to give an answer other than to say I, it is not a closed question. It needs to be carefully examined. Thank you. That's a very, very considered answer. Um, Professor Levin, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, I, I, I'm also, of course, uh, uh, acutely aware of, um, you know, how unpopular uh, uh, advocacy of nuclear energy is. I, I, I've suffered personally from friends, acquaintances, family on this score. My view is that we should not expand nuclear energy until we have the kind of technological advances that Governor Brown has mentioned in terms of safety, you know, new technologies. Uh, in, you know, the, the disposal of nuclear fuel or rather than non-generation nuclear fuel. So we shouldn't expand nuclear energy until those are in place. And if they're not in place, then we shouldn't expand it. Uh, but um, I strongly oppose uh, decommissioning nuclear plants, at least unless they're obviously warm out and unsafe, um, until alternative energy is in a position fully to replace them. Uh, and that also requires, of course, technological change above all the storage, you know, because of the unreliability of the alternative energy supply of many kinds of alternative energy. And we're not there yet. And I think that to abolish nuclear energy um, before we, we are in a position to replace it is, is actually disastrous for, for the fight against climate change. And I, 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 I do in the book as you know, very strongly criticise some of the Green parties from this point of view because their, you know, their agendas are, are so hopelessly unrealistic that they also just play straight into the hands of the opponents of climate change action. Because if they were implemented, indeed, you know, populations would sink into darkness and, and you know, be cooking over wood fires. Um, so that's the, um, the the second thing. The governor raised a very, very important point um, of uh, the question of um, the spread of nuclear technology and uh, you know, security concerns, nuclear weapons in new states, nuclear terrorism. And uh, I think from that point of view, I go back to a point I made in the book and um, mentioned yesterday, uh, which is that um, we shouldn't be expanding expanding nuclear power to, to new countries. And actually, to a considerable extent, we don't need to, because uh, around two thirds of global emissions are produced by only six countries, if you count the, um, the European Union as one, as one block. Uh, and um, there, touch wood, and there's concerns about India, but touch wood, you know, we can be more secure, more confident uh, about uh, the security of nuclear plants. Um, you, you know, of course, in the Soviet Union, you had Chernobyl, obviously the, the only real nuclear disaster. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, astonishingly, that the Soviet Union itself fell to pieces. You had civil wars in certain parts of the country, and yet, to the best of our knowledge, I mean, no nuclear weapon went astray, but also none of the nuclear material went astray, at least none of them could be turned into a nuclear bomb. So I think, uh, I mean, but, but of course, uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm certainly not an advocate of expanding nuclear power to more countries in the world, but the really, you know, just to finish, the point I think we need to keep coming back to, in the end, it's all about carbon emissions. That means focusing on you know, what emits the carbon, but it also means focusing on the, those countries that, that you know, emit most of the carbon. A, a lot of other places in the world will suffer from climate change, but they don't actually contribute to, to it much. And to a certain degree, therefore, we can, you know, we can ignore them and try to you know, concentrate on those countries which actually 
create the problem. And, and there, I think nuclear energy must remain until we can replace it. I would like to add uh, a couple of points. One, uh, to build nuclear power plants is extremely difficult. Uh, look at Germany, uh, look at the United States, look at the world. So they're expensive. Uh, they're, there's lots of uh, uh, hurdles in the way of building a plant. So it's not a easy glide path to make significant carbon reductions. I think that's an important point, whatever theoretical value it can have. Uh, I might say in, in this regard, uh, the names, uh, not only uh, uh, James Hansen, but uh, Jim, James Lovelock uh, said in his book, Gaia's Revenge, that unless the world builds a thousand nuclear reactors, and this was 20 years ago, uh, the last breeding pair of human beings would slink toward Antarctica. So that, that's a, a strong statement uh, by Mr. Lovelock. Um, and Stuart Brand, who did the whole Earth Catalog, is completely dedicated uh, to nuclear power as an as a important solution. On the other hand, uh, my close environmental advisors don't see it that way at all. And I would offer this one point. Reducing emissions, uh, as Anatol just said, that's what we're up to. And there's a lot of ways to re reduce emissions that we're not using. So uh, the difficulty of of um, uh, building nuclear uh, is very competitive with the difficulty of curbing uh, carbon, whether it's a price on carbon or whether it's rules to restrict uh, activities that generate uh, greenhouse gases. So we're kind of caught betwixt and between, uh, and it, it is an important topic, but relative to the climate challenge, there's so many other things we need to do right now. Uh, to get the uh, political will, mobilization, to take actions all over the world in, with transportation, with uh, electricity, uh, going to renewable, with uh, other kinds of manufacturing processes, agricultural lands, uh, airline, airplanes and ships, lots to do uh, to change fuel and change behavior. Uh, I was just on the uh, freeway of California yesterday uh, going from Northern California to San Francisco, bumper to bumper. Uh, it's been as crowded as it ever was. And most of those cars are emitting uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, there's a lot to do with just the way we organize our lives, our imagination, our machinery, and the fuels that, that feed it. So uh, it, it's a, this is a mixed bag here. And I think it deserves uh, a lot of thoughtful analysis. Thank you. Um, you certainly provided, you and Professor um, Levin have certainly provided the thoughtful analysis there um, to the rather, um, to, to the essentially very complicated question of nuclear energy and, and the pros and cons. Um, I now need um, to stop being greedy and to hand over to the fellows.